Merry Christmas, and welcome to our four-part New Life Living teaching series, Fresh Eyes, Seeing Christmas in a New Light. So now let's join Pastor Alan Brooks as he leads us in our study. If you're here visiting uh, this morning, you may not know we've been in a series that we're going to conclude here this morning called Fresh Eyes. And part of the idea has been that we want to look at a very familiar story but we want to come to it with fresh eyes to to see some things maybe we haven't seen before that I think God would have hoped that we could see. We've certainly seen Mary, this beautiful young woman we would imagine, young Jewish girl excited about her future, and it's turned upside down when she finds out that she's going to be pregnant with the Son of God. What a great gift, though, if you think about it, right? I mean, to be honored with giving the Son of God, to our world, to the very place that we're here to celebrate today. And that's part of the reason we give gifts at Christmas time, right? In remembrance of that great gift that was given to us. Any of you, though, have ever got a weird or a, a, a bad gift? I mean, anybody? Okay. What, what, what have you received? Just shout it out. It was a really ugly fish pin. Uh, an ugly fish pin. <laughs> I think that says it all right there. With, with like fins and gills or something on it, right? But they were all natural, so that probably. <laughs> Anybody else have kind of a weird... By the way, you can't say it's a weird gift if the person who gave it to you is here, okay? So white elephant gift, right? Squirrel underpants. Squirrel underpants. Yeah, fortunately it was intended to be a joke, right? Yes. A canned ham. A canned ham. That goes right up there in my mind with that other delicious holiday treat called... Fruitcake, right? Do people still get... By the way, if you bought one, I apologize in advance, okay? But does anybody still give those out? Okay. Well, homemade is probably different. That's a whole lot different than the ones that are in, in the can. Did I see a hand over here? Okay. I remember when I was 10 years old... Uh, going back to Oklahoma, one of my aunts back there, and she was so excited for me to unwrap this gift. I could tell real quickly it was an album, which kind of dates me, I know. But, because, you know, an album's pretty obvious in its size. Record album, to be clear. And so I open it up, and it's this band called Rare Earth. And I'm like, who in the world is that, right? And and I'm a 10-year-old kid, and she's so excited to see my face with this gift. Now, who, who, who knows, maybe that's a classic, you know, worth a lot of money thing, which if I hadn't given it away would probably be good. But, <laughs> but it wasn't a gift for me that I thought was pretty awkward. I saw a list this week, and just to share a few of these that struck me, but it was 10 things to say about a gift that you don't like. One of them that I liked was, boy, if I had not recently shot up four sizes, that would have fit. Someone else said, perfect for wearing in my basement. (laughs) And here's probably my favorite. I love it, but I fear the jealousy it will inspire. (laughs) Last but not least, to think I got this the year that I vowed to give all of my gifts to charity. But in this series of Fresh Eye, we've seen how God works in mysterious ways, and in in ways, in some cases, that turn people's lives upside down. We've looked at Mary, as I mentioned. We've looked at the shepherds that God looked down upon with favor and announced the birth of his child. We saw these wise men for over 500 years. Their people have been watching for this star in the sky, and they get to come and finally see baby Jesus face to face. But we've left out one of our cast of character. Have you caught that? Who's somebody we haven't talked about? Joseph, the husband of Mary. I would suggest that if there was an award, Joseph probably would get the award for the best supporting character. Because if you think about it, a lot of this has more to do with Mary and God and all those interactions, and he's just coming alongside of this whole event. And as I look at Joseph, I recognize there's some things about Joseph that we should consider. First of all, for me, I think he's kind of an enigma, a mystery, if you will. We don't see a lot of information about this father, or stepfather, if you want to call it, of Jesus, this man named Joseph. We read about him in the birth narratives of Matthew 
and Luke, we see a couple of vague references to him in Mark and John, usually speaking of Jesus, that he was the son of a carpenter, which by the way, that word carpenter is technon, which actually can mean any kind of a craftsman. He could have well been a general contractor building buildings, Joseph. But what's curious is we last see him when Jesus doesn't show up for a meal while they're traveling back from Jerusalem. And Mary and Joseph have to go back to the temple. He's 12 years old, and they find him there teaching some of the religious leaders. But after that, Joseph kind of mysteriously vanishes off of the pages of our scripture. And for me, that's kind of a mystery, and it'll be interesting to find out exactly what happened. There's a lot of theories, a lot of mythology that goes with what happened to Joseph. But what I want to see is what he did that probably most of us men in particular would not have done. And that was to stand alongside a woman that he loved dearly, who was now carrying the son, a child of someone else. Let's check this out and see what Scripture has to tell us about this great guy. I'm going to start in Matthew 1. This is 1. It's towards the end of the genealogy. Let's jump in at verse 16. And Jacob, note that by the way, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together... She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now, if you're much of a Bible student, you probably have learned or heard that there are different genealogies in Matthew and in Luke, the birth record of Jesus. Both of them, though, establish this special place of who he is, that he is the promised son of David, which in that first century culture would have indicated that he was the Messiah that they had been waiting for. Most believe that Luke traces Mary's lineage. Almost universally, people believe that Matthew tracks Joseph's lineage. Now, what's interesting for you to know is that Joseph's lineage, which we find in Matthew, is the royal line. It as well is tracking back through David, but it tracks back through the one who became king after David. Does anybody remember his name? Solomon. So that's where it's through. And part of the reason that we see a difference, I think, in these two genealogies, and most scholars would tell you the same, is that later on in the royal line, God placed a curse upon Jeconiah. And he said that no one would ever rule from that line again. you got to think that the enemy thought that he got one over you know, at that point. Because how, how could the promised Messiah come from that son of David? Well, that's what's so amazing in the lineage that we see in Luke. Because it tracks through the bloodline on Mary's side of the family. Going through a different son through the son Nathan of King David. But what a great example of how our God is able to take different paths and arrive at the same purpose that he's always intended. We see here as well in Matthew that Mary and Joseph were betrothed. We've talked about that before in our series, and for those of you who haven't heard this, this is much more than a modern engagement. In an ancient betrothal, they were actually called husband and wife. And they lived in separate households, but they were still called husband and wife within the community. Part of the idea behind this, for those of you that haven't heard this before, was to establish the purity of the relationship of this man and this woman. 
And so for a year, they lived in their own parents' household. And only after that year of purity waiting did they come together and have the great ceremony of marriage through a wedding, which, as I've mentioned, the Jews were great about this. Typically, a wedding ceremony would last a week. The community would all come together, and this is where they're at. But it says here in this that it was before they came together. Now, that's a euphemism, right? Meaning, of course, that this is before Mary and Joseph had had any kind of sexual relation. But then it tells us this amazing thing, that she is found to be with child. I don't know if you've asked yourself, because I really thought a lot more about this in this series, but when did Joseph find out? In fact, how did Joseph find out? Did he hear it through gossip in the community? Did he hear it from Mary himself? Let's take a little bit of take take a look at what scripture tells us a little bit about it. It appears to me that he doesn't immediately hear about it. In fact, I would go so far to say that it doesn't appear that Mary initially may be told anyone. Let me tell you how I arrive at that. If we go back to a study we did in Luke earlier in this series, We see Mary saying, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Most of you hopefully remember that. Let it be to me according to your word. And it says, The angel departed from her, and in those days Mary arose and went with haste, did you catch that? Into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. We learned earlier in this passage, because the angel was validating this miracle of her receiving God's child by pointing to a miracle in the fact that her relative Elizabeth in her old age had conceived a child as well. Does anybody remember how far along Elizabeth was when the angel Gabriel came? In the sixth month. Now notice what the next verse 56 tells us in Luke 1. It says, Mary remained with her about three months and return to her home. What I think we can infer from that is that Mary stayed with her relative Elizabeth through the remainder of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And after John, who we know is the baptizer, was born, she then comes back to Nazareth. Now, at this point, she's how far along? She's probably got a little bit of a watermelon thing starting to grow, right? I mean, she's got a little bump, very possibly, that's seen. When she comes back into town, it's hard to know, they wore long flowing robes in those days, those days, but at some point, it becomes clear that she is with child. We learn as well that Joseph, when he learned, however it is that he learned of this, he could have turned it into a public shaming. In the first century, they still had had the Jewish law that told them to stone someone who was caught in sexual sin. But unfortunately, because of the Romans, they had lost the right to do their own killings. And so really what happened typically in the first century is they would shame the person. Joseph could have, if he wanted to, had her publicly shamed and ostracized before the whole community. But notice what it tells us about him. It says that he was a just man. The word literally means righteous man, with the technical understanding being that he was a man who did what God wanted him to do. Some might argue that God wanted her to be shamed for this sexual sin because that's the way they saw it that she had in fact been with another man. Of course we know that God knows differently, right? God knows in fact that she is a pure woman. God in fact knows that it is by the Holy Spirit that she's become pregnant. But Joseph doesn't yet know that, as far as we can tell. So he's in what I would call a dilemma. He wants to do the righteous thing first and foremost before who? Before God. Because that's the most important thing, that we do right before God. But secondarily, I suggest that he greatly cares and loves this girl. And he wants to do right by her as well. So instead of publicly shaming her, 
he decides to put her away quietly and simply to have a divorce because that's what was required of a betrothal. Again, different than an engagement, they had to literally have a writ of divorce to end that relationship. And that's where Joseph is at. That's what he's determining in his mind. Let's go into verse 20. Matthew continues and he says, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Hopefully you've caught in this series that there was a lot of angelic activity around this great birth. And even before the announcement to Mary, we see that an angel appeared to Zechariah as he was coming out of the temple to announce that John was going to be born to he and Elizabeth. We fast forward a little bit. Six months later, angel Gabriel comes to Mary in person to announce this great thing. When the baby is born, an angel followed by a choir of angels announce it to the shepherds. But now what we see is someone else who has an angelic messenger as well. But don't miss how this is different. Where all the others, it appears, they saw the angel in person while they were awake. Here we see that Joseph is probably lying on his bed. He's contemplating all this, wondering how this could have ever happened in his life. And my guess is he fell asleep. And while he's asleep, the angel comes to him in that dream. This, by the way, is the first of three occasions where this happens. Notice the angel's greeting. He greets Joseph by saying, Joseph, what? What's the next part? Son of David. He's acknowledging this great lineage from which Joseph comes. And a reminder, I think, to him that he's part of this royal family line. But then the angel says, don't fear to take Mary as your wife. It's a curious thing. And again, I'd ask you to hold on to that thought for a minute. We'll come back to it. The angel goes to say, this child is from the Holy Spirit. And this is long before amniocentesis. (laughs) The angel is able to tell Joseph that the child is going to be a boy, a son. That in itself was very much a miracle in the first century. But it goes on, the angel does, to say, name him. Many of us maybe miss this, but in the first century, in a Jewish household, the man was responsible for naming the child. You know, in our culture today, it's usually a kind of a community effort between husband and wife and maybe some extended family members, right? But here in the first century, what they would do is the man would literally lay that child over his knees and pronounce the name upon that child. The name at times was something passed down through the family, but other times it was intended to acknowledge a special calling or a special circumstance around that child's birth. Would you think there's any kind of special calling around this child's birth? The angel, in fact, says so. He says that this child will save his people from their sins. What child has ever been born that had the ability to do that? He also indicates that this is fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. This is Isaiah 7, verse 14, where there it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. What's also curious about Jesus' ministry, except for this time here in Matthew, we never have any recorded time in which Jesus is referred to as Emmanuel. Many believe that this is commonly what we see in prophecy, where a prophet is giving an indication of a a future event and then a yet other future event. 
that in fact when we'll probably most know Jesus as Emmanuel would be during his millennial reign on the earth when in fact he is fully God with us at that time. But what I love in Joseph is his righteous response. Joseph puts away the hurts and even as the passage refers to the fears that he has in regards to this relationship with Mary. And he does what the angel has commanded him. He takes Mary as his wife. And unlike some faith traditions have, it says that they weren't intimate until after this child was born. I think what we rarely consider is that the front end stuff, the hurt and the betrayal, as hard as that was, that was really the easy part. See, it was what happened after that. See, because the shame that Mary is now enduring because of this pregnancy while she's not yet fully married, that shame is now being extended to whom? To Joseph. In fact, because he stays by this woman, people are naturally believing what? That he's the father. I mean, what other guy would have stood by her if it was another man's child? But yet, Joseph stays and supports Mary. I wonder how that affected his righteous reputation. A man who had grown up being obedient to the Jewish law, doing the things of God exactly as he had been told, or as best he could. Do you think that had any impact upon his righteous reputation? I believe it did. In addition, I would say that it had an impact upon his livelihood because people recognized him as that sinner who was part of this woman who had this contrived story about this immaculate conception that God had somehow made her pregnant. Jump over with me to Matthew chapter 2. Verse 13 there in Matthew 2 says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. This is the second dream message that Joseph gets, and he's told to go to Egypt and wait. Again, part of what we don't get by just looking at this is at this point in history, Egypt is an enemy of Israel. This is not a very safe place that they're being told to go and take up haven at this point. And we can tell the extent of the danger because they leave immediately. And unlike what is common in our world where people travel at night, they travel at night to get away from Bethlehem. Why? Because Herod is going to that contingency plan that we talked about before. Herod is now seeking to kill that child. And as you'll read on in that passage, if you will, you'll see that Herod had his army go to Bethlehem and kill all of the male children that were under the age of two. It was a small village. We have no idea how many male children were involved. Could have been upwards of 20, could have been as little as 10 or 15. But still, imagine the horror within that community as the Romans came in and killed all of those small children. We see this out of Egypt piece, which is a prophecy from Hosea. Hosea 11.1 1 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And then this profound thing that we see fulfilled here, Out of Egypt, I called my son. What also I find curious about Egypt is the scripture records that when Jesus returns to rule and reign upon the earth during the millennial reign, the thousand-year reign of Christ upon the throne here in this world, we see that Egypt is one of the favored countries. Isaiah 19 tells us this. It says, In that day Israel will be third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth. 
Ironic, isn't it? Where there are enemies with Israel 2,000 years ago, they will come to be one of those honored and favored by God during the millennium. Herod the Great is an interesting character. Compared with all the other characters that we've taken a look at, there's a lot of historical information outside of Scripture about Herod. Josephus is one of the historians that we look to for this. And part of what we learn about Herod the Great, as he's known, is that this time when Jesus was a child, he was an old man. Some would say he was a bitter old man. Very paranoid about not only his throne, but the future of his rule through his own children. In fact, he had at least a couple of his children killed because they weren't completely loyal to him. History records that he died in 4 B.C., which, if you don't catch this, shows us that our calendar is off a little bit. Most of us think that Jesus was born in 0 B.C. or something in that range. In fact, it was probably more likely that he was born in 5 or 6 B.C. in terms of that actual calendar. When his kingdom was divided among his sons, Archelaus, who we see here in this passage, became the king over the area of Judea. It would appear that he was just as dangerous as his father to this young family, which leads this young family to go somewhere that, to me at least, is even more surprising. Verse 19 in Matthew 2 says, When Herod died... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, this is his third dream message, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he, Joseph, went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. So because of Archelaus, Bethlehem isn't an option. But they instead go back to Nazareth. Now, if you were just simply reading the account in Matthew, you wouldn't catch the significance of this. But when we tie what we know about Luke, this is where this family has been from, right? This is where this whole thing originally went down. It's incredibly likely that that community knew all about this couple and how this woman had become pregnant before they had actually had the marriage ceremony. It's amazing to me how much humility that would have taken to go back to that place. But that is the place that Joseph takes his young family. is isn't as common to hear it today, but when I was growing up, a child who was illegitimate was often referred to as a bastard. It's a horrific word in a lot of ways, but it referred to somebody who was born out of the marriage relationship. And it was often carried into the classroom at school if that information was known. I wonder how much that tainted Jesus' own growing up. You ever thought about that? That in fact, Jesus was considered the illegitimate child in this small community. It says here that he would be called a Nazarene. Maybe that was somewhat of a first century version of our word. But what's curious about this here is there is no known prophecy of Jesus being called a Nazarene from the Hebrew scriptures. Many believe it's possibly a double play on Isaiah's prophecy, where it says that he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. You and I typically think of that in relationship to the cross. But what if, in fact, this young man that we know as Jesus grew up in that very way, as despised and rejected by those in the community in which he lived? It frames his childhood in a way differently than I think most of us probably have looked at it. 
Another thing that I would point out to you, and I mentioned this on the front, that Joseph's father, what was his name? Did you catch that? Jacob. I find it curious that there are two Josephs. If you'll research a Bible dictionary, you'll see there's one Joseph that we read a lot of information about. He's the Old Testament Joseph. But what's curious is how much this New Testament Joseph, the husband of Mary, and the Old Testament Joseph share together. Because the Old Testament Joseph also had a father named Jacob. We also know that both of these Joseph went to Egypt. We know, in fact, that both of these men, these two Josephs, were known as righteous men. The Old Testament Joseph, you might recall, while he was working you know, in the household, was actually attempted to be seduced by the lady of that household. And what does he do? He flees. What I think is the contrast that I catch from this is here's a man in the midst of a situation where this woman comes to him and says, I've been pregnant by God. Where most men would have fleed away from her, he chooses to stand alongside of her. The other curious thing about our New Testament Joseph, there's not a single word recorded that he spoke did you know that? But what we see with Joseph is literally no recorded words. A great truth for me there is that something we've heard before, our actions, they always speak louder than our words, don't they? Would you say that Joseph's actions lined up with being a righteous man? That he did the righteous thing? The other truth that I think we should pull away from Joseph's life is to do the right thing even when it's more difficult for us personally. We should always do the right thing. Now, I know that intellectually we know that, right? But a lot of times we weigh in a balance doing the right thing. What kind of impact is it going to have on me personally? How is this going to affect my livelihood? But Joseph didn't do any of those things. He knew that God wanted him to stand by and support this woman. So even though it was a very difficult thing for him to do, that's what he did. Which to me shows how God knew that he indeed was a just and a righteous man. I started this series by sharing that this was a very unpredictable story. God chooses to bring a child, not to a, a wedded couple who are together, but to a virgin. Unpredictable. He reveals the birth, not to the religious elite of Israel, but he reveals the birth to the shepherds who are despised by the people. The people who come to worship the birth of this newborn king come from thousands of miles away, and they're foreigners. It doesn't even appear that hardly anybody came from his own country, from Israel. What an unpredictable story. It says he would be called a Nazarene, a despised one, a rejected one. We see this in Nathaniel's response when Philip, his friend, says, Hey, you've got to come meet him. We have found the Messiah. And you recall what Nathaniel said? Ha! Can anything good come from Nazareth? Do you recall what Philip's response to Nathaniel was. Come and see. Come and see. See, what we're inviting people to do at Christmas is to come and see in this unpredictable story the greatest Christmas gift that anybody would ever receive. The answer to all of life's drama and troubles found in a single person that we know is Jesus. He is why we celebrate this afternoon and invite friends and family to come celebrate because it is our hope that they would come and see and see that indeed he is that newborn king. Amen. Would you stand? Let's pray. Thanks for listening in. 
If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.